to the Bean Ninjas podcast, where you get an all-access pass to see what happens behind the closed doors of a fast-growing global bookkeeping and financial reporting business. Welcome, everyone, to the Bean Ninjas podcast. I'm Wayne Richard, and we're talking Amazon, Shopify, and e-commerce profits with Paul Gray of A2X. Welcome to the show, Paul. How are you doing today, and where are you joining us in from? Thanks, Wayne. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. And uh, I am speaking to you today from the uh, New Zealand countryside near uh, Auckland. Excellent. Paul, what is it about New Zealand in fintech, both yourself and Zero, both out of New Zealand? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it's not a coincidence. You know, um, Zero has done uh, great things for cloud accounting all around the world, and uh, an ecosystem has grown up um, around Zero in New Zealand and in Australia, uh, and of course now in other countries as well. But I think some, maybe some of the the early software companies that started working with Zero, solving business problems surrounding the core accounting needs. Um, it's been a natural progression for them to uh, take their solutions where uh, where zero is strong. Excellent. Well, today, Paul, you want to share with our audience your insights to Amazon and tips on leveraging software to grow your e-commerce store profits. But before you do, I'd like for you to share just a bit about yourself to our listeners and also hear from you your introduction of A2X. Um, sure. Well, um, a little bit about me. I uh, am a New Zealander. I'm sure you've figured that out by now, uh, although I have uh, lived a lot of places around the world, including uh, eight years living uh, in the US. Um, I'm from a country area of New Zealand, uh, from a family of orchardists, uh, but my career has been in software and uh, e-commerce. And um uh, and now that I'm back in New Zealand, I have uh, two children, I have uh, a little bit of land, uh, I have a dog, uh, and uh, I have a couple of paddocks out the front with uh, 20 and a half sheep, and the half is a, a, a very small sheep. So uh, that is the uh, lifestyle, but from um, here, uh, I run um, A2X, which is a software app for businesses that sell online with Shopify stores or through Amazon marketplaces. It connects those e-commerce sales channels to cloud accounting systems such as uh, Xero, QuickBooks Online and others. And what A2X does is give e-commerce businesses confidence in their financials. Basically, it makes sure the numbers that turn up in the uh, profit and loss statement, the balance sheet relating to Shopify sales, Amazon sales, those numbers are right. And you know they're right because with A2X, they balance with the cash that's in your bank account. So really, it's all about having confidence that you've got the right numbers in your financial statements, which means that when you see the profit at the bottom of the profit and loss, you know that at least for sales through Shopify and Amazon, the numbers are correct. So how did the idea of A2X come about and who's it best used for? Well, it's, uh, it's best used for businesses that are selling you know, more than a handful of orders a month through um, Shopify, through Amazon or both. Um, and, um, you know, as soon as you have a real business, sooner or later, you're going to need accurate accrual accounting financials. And, uh, and that's what A2X is, is, is for. Um, how did it come about? Well, it, it came from a, um, a business need that, uh, that I experienced. Uh, you know, gosh, it was way back in 2008. It was the early days of what's now called FBA, Amazon's FBA program. I don't think it even had that name at that time. It was more of a, uh, a pilot project um, inside the corner of one Amazon fulfillment center. And uh, I started an international e-commerce business um, sending uh, products from Australia and New Zealand that had never been available in the United States before. 
Um, I think maybe we were the first people to send an international shipment directly into FBA. Of course, thousands upon thousands of people do that today, but in 2008, that certainly wasn't the case. Um, anyway, we made the got the first products there, made the first sale, and uh, a few weeks later received our first settlement payment from Amazon. And, uh, you know, it was my job to run the financial side of, uh, of the e-commerce business. And uh, I looked at the dollars that arrived in the bank account and I looked at the sales and I thought, how do you, you know, is it right? Have I got paid the right amount? Uh, right. You know, I went to Seller Central, um, found I could download a, a settlement file and I looked at it. And look, I've had a long career in software. I've done a lot of data analysis and worked with a lot of file formats. And I've got to say, I was pretty shocked how, badly structured that settlement file was uh, in 2008 uh, and I can assure you it um, has only got worse since then. It's a um, pretty interesting set of data that that, that comes out of uh, those files. Anyway, I waded through it, uh, reconciled it all in a uh, spreadsheet and of course that first settlement, it spanned sales in one month and then the next month or it might have spanned a quarter end or something like that so splitting the transactions into the right financial period was kind of a bit of a headache we figured out how to do it in spreadsheets and make it reconcile to the cash and we were doing that on a two weekly cycle with the settlement payments uh, and then you know you don't have to have uh, too many sales before that becomes a, a, a really old thing right you don't really want to do it after you've done it about three times uh, so we automated that spreadsheet um, and then we were selling more, you know, hundreds, maybe, maybe, maybe a thousand orders a month. And then it just outgrew the capability of a spreadsheet. There's so much data that comes out through those Amazon settlement files that we needed to automate that with software. Um, and I guess little did we know that no one else anywhere seemed to be, you know, I guess it's early days of Amazon, right? There weren't that many, um, uh, merchants selling on Amazon marketplaces, um, um, but uh, it, the origins of A2X really can be traced back to that time, which is, gosh, what, 12 years ago now. Um, first-hand experience um, working with Amazon settlement um, transactions in the US, and by then it would have been the UK also in Canada and a little bit in Japan, and, um, uh, and then the European marketplaces opened up and we had all those currencies, um, and uh, A2X was was built to account accurately, basically reconcile everything back to the cash that arrived in bank accounts, uh, and and uh, and then we've we've developed that into um, the A two X product that's available today. And it's interesting, Paul, the insight and clarity that we're able as an accounting services provider able to give to our customers when we show them the results that come out of not just at really breaking out those settlements into the true gross sales versus the volume of in variety of Amazon fees that many of them aren't even aware are being charged to them, nor have previously identified the trends to help manage and affect those costs within their own businesses. Yeah. Well, hey, you're absolutely right, Wayne. I mean, um, there's a there was a Seller Central has a, a monthly financial summary page that was added, I guess, after a few thousand complaints by sellers. They couldn't account for their Amazon sales properly. That's the ones who probably didn't know about A2X. Um, but that monthly summary page, you know, it has a revenue number on there that's not really revenue. It bundles in a whole lot of things like sales tax collected and stuff that's not revenue. Um, and A2X allows that to be split out into the, the correct um, categories. But you make a good point about people not knowing about the fees, and it, it's no wonder because, you know, there are over 300 transaction types that can flow into a seller's uh, merchant account now. Um, now, any one seller probably doesn't see all 300 of those. Some of them are regional. Um, you know, there's a whole lot relating to only to Europe, and there's some relating only to tax in Australia and so forth. Um, uh, but when you think about the different, there's, people know about FBA fees, there are a lot of different variations on that. Um, but you've got Amazon lending, you've got the different advertising programs, you've got you know all the adjustments and service charges. 
Um, and um, if you if you didn't know to dig under the covers, you're absolutely right. You just get that net amount, and I don't know. Maybe a lot of people just assume that that um, I don't know what people assume. But the thing is, some of them are actually balance sheet transactions, not P and L transactions. You really do need to put them in the right place in your financials. Agreed. So A two X was built really to scratch your own niche. I want to share with you an interesting stat that I read on Web Retailer. It stated that 72% of Amazon sellers use no third-party tools within their business. So I'm curious about the initial launch of A2X when you made it a product available for purchase. Was it an instant hit or was it even a goal of yours to release the tool to market? How did you get your first 100 clients? Yeah. Uh, well, you've got me thinking back to how how did we how did we launch A two X? No, I I I do remember it. You know, we'd been using A two X for our own international uh, e commerce business for a while. We knew it worked. We knew it was um, bulletproof. Um, and really, it was this idea that if if we were striking these challenges. Um, in making sense of the Amazon settlement transactions and putting it into a form that made sense for accounting, um, surely sooner or later, lots of other Amazon sellers would run into the same problem or have the same questions or have the same need. Um, what we did, though, um, is we made a really simple one-page website that said, we've got this piece of software that does these things, you know, it'll it'll sort out your Amazon transactions and post it to your financials so that it all reconciles and balances. If you're interested, you know, type in your email address and we'll get back to you. It really was as simple as that. Um, and um, to this day, I really don't know how people found us, but they did. And uh, some of them were, were, were sellers that had been trying to reconcile things. Uh, quite a few were, were actually... Um, accountants you know and um we'd said to ourselves well hey if if 100 people um want to use this software then we'll reinvest in it to be a fully fledged commercial quality product um and we gave it some something like six months or a year um and uh when we looked at it again it wasn't 100 people it was 200 people and it's at that point where we um, stepped it up, um, made major investments in um, um, in software engineering and uh, making it easier to get started and, um, you know, quick start capabilities to, to really help people uh, get on top of their accounting for uh, Amazon sales. So, Paul, I know one of the interesting approaches you've taken to growth is really around building a partner community, really based in advocacy. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And would you mind perhaps sharing your top three tips for identifying great partners? Yeah, thanks, um, Wayne. Great question. Uh, I think for us it was really when we realized that um, e-commerce businesses out there were getting a better result when they had a specialist uh, bookkeeper or accountant involved in supporting their business. <clears throat> and, um, um, you know, a lot of people come to us directly and um, if they have some accounting knowledge, absolutely they can deploy A2X and get those benefits and those numbers to their accountant. Um, but there are plenty of people out there in business who don't want to spend their time doing their own bookkeeping and accounting. They have, uh, and they're the ones who, who really... Um, have that uh, need, or should I say, will get benefit from dealing with a specialist accountant who understands e-commerce. The business models are different. The transaction flows are different. There are some particular challenges in uh, accounting for e-commerce businesses. And uh, so um, um, at A2X, we do a lot of work to provide materials and educational information and quick start guides and things for bookkeepers that are maybe coming uh, new or fresh into the e-commerce world. And um, um, 
look, there are millions of e-commerce businesses out there. Um, there's there's a huge need for specialist expertise to help them all with their books. Um, you also asked how do we um, – what do we look for in a partner or what makes a great um, – uh, I guess if uh, I could interpret that question as what makes a, uh, a strong e-commerce uh, uh, accountant that would be a partner to use A2X. I think probably the first thing is that um, desire to specialize in e-commerce, recognizing that um, it's not the same as uh, a, a bricks and mortar retail store. Um, the way the businesses are organized is different. It's a specialist discipline. So uh, an accountant or a firm that is focused on e-commerce as a vertical, uh, that's certainly one of the first things. And it, it's not that we need that. It's that it's the firm specializing in e-commerce accounting that are delivering the best value to their clients and are having them, quite frankly, having the most um, success. People are flocking to the specialists now. Um, secondly, I think it's not just about um, saying, you know, we can do QuickBooks or we can do zero. It's about uh, adding value through uh, having a way to do um, e-commerce financials that uh, delivers real value to, to the client. And that might be standardized processes. It might be, you know, standard tools that are proven that you've got a, a, an app architecture that you can deploy that just takes a whole lot of cost out of the equation. Um, and, uh, and I think probably the third thing is um, it's, that, it's that customer focus. Um, a firm that has thought about what the needs of an e-commerce business are and has offerings that um, that make sense for an e-commerce business model. You know, if you've got a, a, a private seller Amazon FBA business, for example, um, there are certain things that a private label FBA seller needs. There are lots of things that they don't need. If you can package that up as a fixed price or a subscription service or a you know, a la carte, you know, would you like this? Would you like that? If you have a Shopify store, then we can handle that for, you know, this price, which gets right away from the old fashioned, um, um, you know, I'll do the job for you and charge my hours at the end of the month, um, which I think e-commerce businesses are, are, are well beyond that. And they're thinking about how they want their business to run. Absolutely. I'll add a fourth, and I would say it's confidence in their numbers. I really think it comes down to our relationship with our customers coming down to doing the right thing, mm -hmm. but also having a trusted relationship that we're able to deliver timely, accurate financial reports, because these are the tools they use to make data-driven decisions around how they're going to run their businesses. Interesting that you say that because uh, giving people confidence in their e-commerce sales and fee numbers, that's that's a theme for A2X as well. Excellent. Well, Paul, you mentioned earlier that you've been in the Amazon FBA space before it even really had a name. Let me ask you, do you feel as though you can still make money on Amazon FBA in 2020? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, uh, it's certainly true that there's more competition for certain categories and certain products and um, uh, all that kind of thing. The advertising costs are higher. Um, but I think that um, the old truths are still truths, which is um, a business that's adding value by bringing a product to market that solves problems for customers, um, you know, uh, I, th I think it all comes back to a business that's adding value. There's there's huge opportunities selling with Amazon and uh, FBA is just the obvious way to serve that channel. So what are some things happening within the marketplace that sellers should really be paying attention to right now? Well, I think um, what's been really significant over the last year or so is um, what Amazon's been doing with uh, what they call the brand registry and the way that it's sort of their third go at it over the course of about seven or eight years. Um, but it's really becoming the um, gate or the, the channel by which, uh, this would be very true of private label sellers, um, uh, by which a, a brand and its products 
um, get through, get listings onto Amazon. And there are more and more constraints, yeah. more and more um, Amazon programs that are only available once the, a brand is registered. And more recently, um, the brand registry program has required trademarks. That's pushed a lot of people to pursue trademarks that otherwise wouldn't have, wouldn't have bothered, wouldn't have needed them. Um, I read an article earlier this week about how the um, um, trademark office is now overwhelmed by new trademark applications, and I, you know, I couldn't help wondering whether um, Amazon's brand registry might be might be part of the reason for that. Um, so I think you know you can't ignore that anymore. It's not a matter of just listing a product uh, any old time you feel like it. That brand registry is, has become very important. Um, I think the changes in in um, in the United States in sales tax, who's calculating and collecting sales tax, um, ostensibly to simplify things. In a lot of ways, it's maybe made it just as complicated, but in a different way. Uh, and in parallel with that, there's some really complicated things going on with VAT in um, the UK and Europe. There's the uncertainty of um, what effect Brexit might have on some of the VAT rules. Um, and some of the ways that um, FBA programs in Europe work with pan-EU FBA where a, a sale is made and as the seller you don't know where the item is going to be shipped from and yet you're expected to charge the correct VAT on that sale. Um, there's still a lot of complexity um, there matching the actual VAT reporting and, and tax filing with what's going on under the covers in, uh, in FBA's pan-EU program. So, you know, those are areas that, um, especially for larger sellers or sellers that are operating in, in all those different marketplaces, um, you've got to keep an eye on, on those because the, the goalposts do, do move just about every year, it seems. Um, and I guess the third thing I'd mention is um, there seems to be an acceleration recently in new Amazon marketplaces opening up. Um, the UAE uh, and Singapore being two recent examples um, of new Amazon marketplaces, new potential customers and markets for um, sellers that are that are that are willing to take that step. What's exciting for me is even as quickly as these trends come about, software is developed to help address those labor intensive what used to be manual processes, we could probably do a whole nother episode just around sales tax, uh, processing, identifying Nexus. And it's great to see that there's software tools that sellers can use to help them better understand their liabilities, automate the registrations and filings of this big topic that's come about recently in the market. So I do, I do want to switch gears a little bit. Another recent hot topic in the press has really been centered around big name brands like Nike and Ikea leaving Amazon. It brings up a pretty compelling debate around the viability of alternate marketplaces for merchants like eBay or Walmart. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah. Um, like a lot of things in business, there are, um, um, competing priorities and opportunities and, and, and threats. I think one thing that probably is in the mind of a lot of uh, Amazon sellers, especially as they have some success, is uh, the day you wake up and realize that all your eggs are in the Amazon basket and uh, if Amazon changed a rule or closed down a listing or um, you know, decided that every single one of your units in FBA needed to be checked manually. At, that'll be a four-week process before they re-enable your stock. You know, those are actually major risks to your business. And you start to think about, well, how do I mitigate that risk? One of those ways is to have your products for sale through other sales channels. And especially if you have a brand that is strong enough that people will search for your brand and they will find your product elsewhere, and that can lead you to um, other marketplaces. You've mentioned eBay and, uh, and and Walmart. It can also lead you to uh, the idea of 
well, why not have a brand uh, web store? Um, it's pretty straightforward to bring up a, a Shopify store now to represent your brand. You can tell your brand story that way. Um, and if you've got your stock in FBA, you can, you know, connect those pieces together and still have your, your, your orders shipped out um, without having to have your own warehouse and your own um, order dispatch um, operation stuff. Or you can use it, you know, there's all kinds of ways to, to put that together. Um, yeah, it's interesting how Shopify fits into all this and some of the investments that they're making towards helping sellers manage fulfillment. In your words, Paul, what's the difference between Amazon FBA and Shopify? Who is one better for over the other? Well, I think um, by Amazon FBA, I think you're, you're talking about the idea of an Amazon only go to market where all the stock goes into FBA and sells through one or more Amazon marketplaces. And that's um, an incredibly powerful combination. In fact, it was that the early days of that that led me to get into e-commerce back in 2008 that we were talking about earlier. Um, so who is that better for? That's better for somebody selling into a market where they do not have an operational capability. Um, you know, for me, if I've got a product from Australia, uh, I'm not in um, the UK, so it makes sense for me to put that stock into FBA in the UK, and from there I can serve customers throughout um, Europe. Um Whereas if I was in the United States and I had stock, maybe I've got a, a bricks and mortar store, um, I'm already shipping my own um, mail order things, then it's quite natural for me to have, say, a Shopify store to take extra orders and ship those orders using the processes that I already have. Um, so uh, where... Where you want to go to FBA is where the Amazon marketplace is your dominant or primary or, or exclusive sales channel. Um, where Shopify, I think, comes into its own is there are all kinds of products and services that, for one reason and another, are not suitable for Amazon. They might be categories that Amazon doesn't serve. And in a lot of countries, um, you know, in the United States, Amazon is in almost every physical product category, and there's some notable exceptions to that. But when you look at uh, new markets, um, often the Amazon marketplace will open up just in two or three categories. So every other type of product can't be sold with FBA on Amazon. Um, if we took Amazon Australia, for example, it was something like two years before you could ship uh, a product with a, an expiration date into FBA. So that takes out all your groceries, half your cosmetics and skincare products, all that kind of stuff. If you can't sell it on Amazon, um, then uh, or you can't sell it with FBA, I should say, you need to have your own order fulfillment capability. Well, why not also take orders through a Shopify store? Um, and, uh, you know, for the people that are selling training courses or other service offerings or one-off artworks or custom um, um, custom-made products, Shopify can be a fantastic fit, whereas Amazon may not be suitable at all for, for many of those types of products. Excellent. Well, Paul, you shared back in late 2014 on your LinkedIn profile three things you need to know about e-commerce. And I'll help remind you, these three things were delivery needs to be free and fast. E-commerce is not about your website anymore. And mobile commerce has taken off. Are these three things still relevant in 2020? And if there was one that you would add or remove, what would it be? Yeah, I'd be... Thanks, Wayne, for pointing that out. I'm casting my mind back to, uh, to to that time. Gosh, that's six years ago now. I think the context for that uh, those points is, you know, Amazon was still an up and coming thing. People were still thinking website first at that time and asking the question of, well, why why should I put my products on Amazon? Um, I think I think we're well past all of that. It, you know, people understand that customer service means fast delivery, Amazon Prime being the leader in that. Um, what would I think about today? 
Today, I would think about where are my customers and where do they want to purchase? So um, it's not about whether I prefer Amazon or Shopify or Magento or Big Commerce. It's about whether my customers prefer to buy direct from me, from a reseller, or they just have an Amazon Prime account and they just really want to buy that product on Amazon. Um, if, you know, I would often say to people, you know, you can take your products off Amazon, but are you sure that their first choice isn't they want to buy something on Amazon? If your product isn't there, they'll buy a competitor's product because they want to buy through Amazon. They trust it. They trust the delivery. They trust the returns policy and so forth. So um, I think think about what it is that the customer wants, what's the customer's preferred shopping channel, and then think about how to get your products to them in the way that the customer wants. Excellent. Well, Paul, it's about time that we wrap up. What we like to do is ask each of our guests this final question. Here at Bean Ninjas, one of our core values is based around freedom. This to us is the right to have control of your time and priorities. You mentioned earlier in the call a bit about lifestyle. What does freedom mean to you? And if you were to put it on a scale of one, just getting started in achieving freedom to 10, being finally free, how would you rate yourself? Oh, I'm probably going to say I'm a seven or eight. We're never quite free of our responsibilities and things we need to do and places we need to be. Um, but I would like to think that um, A2X as an organization is, uh, I think we're very well aligned of what you've said Ben Ninjas is about. Um, we are a distributed organization. Uh, all the people in the A2X team choose where they want to work, when they want to work. Um, it's not unusual for somebody to pick up their family and uh, move to a different country for two or three months of the year and work from there if that's what they want to do, travel as, as a family. Um, some of us prefer to live, you know, where we've got a little bit of space for our families to grow up. Um, other people love to live in the big cities and um, um, that's how we're organized. So, um yeah, freedom to structure your life the way that works for, for you and for your family. I think that's so, so important these days. Excellent. Paul, I appreciated the time today. Thanks so much for being on the Bean Ninjas podcast. Hey, it's been my pleasure. Thank you.